Good day and welcome everyone that's worshiping with us online as well as at all of our sites, at all of our campuses. Glad that we're together and we're continuing with Nehemiah Character Builds episode four. I decided to no longer say chapter two, chapter three, because if you're into Netflix, it's an episode, 13 episodes, all right? So this is episode four and I'm telling you, I have just grown to love and respect Nehemiah so much, and I hope you are too. I mean, his character, his life, the way that he leads, it's so compelling and so helpful. And it's not about what happened thousands of years ago, it's about how it applies for us today. And I know in 2023 that someone here has a big um, challenge that you're facing, or maybe a decision that you have to make, or a solution you're looking to for a problem in your life, and maybe an there's just an opportunity that you're called to seize and you're just like, how do I seize that? And how do I step into it? And it is my prayer that you will grow in confidence. Our key word, theme word for the year is confidence, not confidence in self, confidence in Christ. And Nehemiah has this confidence that I think teaches us how to be confident with God. Remember last week when he's challenged, what is it that you have that you think you'll be successful when everybody else has been unsuccessful in rebuilding these walls after 90 years? And he responds so simply, so precisely because the God of heaven will give me success. It's not a prideful statement. It's a hopeful statement. And if you believe the God of heaven will give you success, then you're gonna have a good year. And so we wanna give ourselves to the end, learn from Nehemiah the ways of God as he did and apply that into our own life. So each week we're taking a look at a character quality of Nehemiah and looking at what it looks like for our own lives. And so in episode one, not chapter one, episode one, we looked at prayer, that we are called to pray, not just pray, but to, to pray and, and continue to pray in the midst of life and our journey. We're called to pray, not, in, not just in that parenthetical kind of way, but as an undergirding of our life, which carried into episode two about planning. The great planning that aligns with God purposes for success in your life is always a prayer plus equation. It's prayer plus waiting. It's prayer plus courage. It's prayer plus your attitude. It's prayer plus the planning steps themselves. That was episode two. And then we moved to episode three. We talked about motivation, that we're better together when we're in it together. We're not better just because we're together. We're better when we're in it together. So what is it that motivates you to be in it? And we talked about motivation practices. Uh, when I have purpose, I'm more motivated. When I have ownership, I'm more motivated. When I see progress, I'm more motivated. We looked at some of those motivation practices of Nehemiah. And I know you're gonna be flat out excited for today's message in chapter three, oh, episode four, I mean. It is about organization. And the theme today is that motivation with organization accelerates completion. And you know the opposite is true, that motivation without organization accelerates frustration. That when you have somebody just motivating you with the, this is what's gonna happen, we're gonna win, we're gonna do this, but there's no organizational plan. It can be so absolutely frustrating along the way. And we find in Nehemiah that he has both the vision and the direction, but also the motivation and the organization to take us into the future. So we're gonna talk about organization today. It was about um, a few years ago, and if I, if I think about it deeply, it wasn't a few years ago, it was 20 years ago, so I'm just gonna accelerate. Did anybody else find that the time's going by a little faster than you thought it would? But I was at this leadership conference. It was 7,000 people, business leaders, nonprofit leaders, church leaders. One of the plenary speakers was Kirby John Caldwell, and quite an extraordinary leader. I was excited to hear him, but he came and he captured the attention of everybody in the room when he opened up his speech his talk. He came and he stood in front of 7,000 people and he stared at us. It was awkward. Are you feeling that just the moment? And then he took a step back, didn't say anything. He took his hand and made it a fist and he said, infrastructure is everything. Infrastructure is everything. Infrastructure is everything. I mean, we were scared. This is the beginning of his talk, but he captured our attention. And his point was, he is with business leaders, nonprofit leaders, church leaders all over the world. And he says, everybody has a great vision statement, but few leaders have an organizational plan to make it happen. They don't have the infrastructure. And he's right. 
In your family, if you don't have infrastructure and organization, you're going to limp along uh, more so than a person who does. And so we're being called in this place to step into the reality of how we move forward with the question of how do I organize my life or these people. Last week he was asking, how do I motivate these people after 90 years and two failed attempts of this wall around Jerusalem? Wow, how's it gonna happen? And now he's going, how do I organize these people? How do we organize our lives? Uh, Recently, Carrie had me step in to watch a program. We kind of play off, you know, I'll do, let's do an adventure 007 kind of thing and then we'll do um, something else, like a comedy or romantic comedy. Is that what you call them? Yeah, romantic comedy. She said it's a romantic comedy. So I'll step in, and this wasn't a romantic comedy. She said, I want you to watch this um, series. It's called Sparking Joy with Marie Kondo. (laughs) Some of you know Marie Kondo. She is a Japanese organizational consultant who has now got worldwide fame for helping people to organize around a simple principle, everything in its place and a place for everything. And some of you do that so naturally. But for many of us, we have to learn how to organize. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to learn today. We could call, in fact, um, episode four, um, Sparking Joy with Nehemiah, (laughs) who, who pulls it together to take a wall destroyed for 90 years and two failed attempts and in 52 days to pull it all together and finish the wall. I want to learn from a leader like that. And so I'm taking a step back with that question. How do we organize ourselves to make things happen? So I want to share six habits of highly effective um, organizational people. (laughs) So the first one is simplification. You guys ready for this? Which, by the way, this is chapter three of Nehemiah. Episode four, and chapter three is no easy chapter. You'll see it, and to pull the message together here, I'll explain in a moment, but the first habit of highly successful organized people is simplification, that simplicity increases effectiveness. Do you remember the acronym K-I-S-S, KISS, and what it stands for? Give it to me. Yeah, amazing, people know that. Keep it simple, stupid. You know, that was um, designed by Kelly Johnson who owned that phrase. He was a, the chief engineer at Lockheed Skunk Club who are famous for creating the, the black bird spy, you know, the SR-71 that is still famous today. I'm just telling you, they're all engineers. They are not stupid. And they created this statement with this in mind. The more simply you can explain something, the greater success and outcomes you'll have. It's the invitation to try to simplify as best we can out of the complexity of the world that we we live in and lead in. Nehemiah has this extraordinary ability to take the complex, which I think when he came and arrived last week, you remember he's on horseback and he does this midnight ride around the city. He's assessing, he's defining the reality and he's coming back. He doesn't tell anybody what he's doing, but I think he took out a, a napkin and he wrote down the organizational plan because within just a few days, he's mobilizing people. It was a fairly simple structure. And in fact, there's three things he did not do. He did not start by creating an organizational structure from scratch. It wasn't ground zero. He he took what was there to build off of it. He didn't demoralize people with too complex of org um, charts that he put before the people. He didn't um, assign people through um, a lottery kind of system. No, he used existing structures and natural groupings of people to get the job done. And we're going to learn some of those natural groupings. In fact, we pick it up in chapter three. And if you read chapter three, last week I invited you to, you're thinking, I'm so glad I don't have to preach on this passage. Because the whole passage is the same. It's a bunch of names and a bunch of tasks. But if you look closer, it's, it's much more than that. So it's 32 verses. Got your seatbelt on? I'm kidding you. I'm only going to do four. That gives you the idea. Here it is. Eliashib, the high priest, and his fellow priests went to work and rebuilt the sheep gate. They dedicated it and set its doors in place. The men of Jericho built the adjoining section. And Zakur, son of Imri, built next to them. And the fish gate was rebuilt by the sons of Hassaniah. They laid its beams and put its doors and bolts and bars in place. Mermoth, son of Uriah, repaired the next section. Next to him, Meshalem, son of Berechiah, and made repairs. And next to him, Zadok, son of Bani, also made repairs. The whole chapter is this way. 
So did you pray for me this week? This is the hardest chapter in Nehemiah to preach on. But when you sit in it, it's a marvel at how God's word speaks to us. And I pray that it will speak to each of you as well as we jump into it. You can see what's happened here. The priests are working together. Um, the guys in Jericho are working together. Families are working together. And so the homogeneity principle is alive and well, that like-minded people are willing and want to work with like-minded people around like-minded causes. And that's exactly how the whole thing is set up. And you see this motivation that happens around simplicity, that he takes the beauty of these people that simplicity brings about this stickiness greater than complexity, that simplicity leads to greater effectiveness. That's the first habit of highly organized people. So I guess you have to ask the question, is what I'm doing communicated in simplicity enough that people get it? So to the end that they wanna do it and we get the outcome. You might in your family say, could we simplify this? Or in our team at work, could we simplify this? It's the first habit. The second habit of highly organized people is participation, to work with those who want to work. And you heard me say this a few weeks ago that there are three kinds of people. There are those who make things happen, there are those who watch things happen, and there are those who stand around trying to figure out what's happening. And when you look at the people who make things happen, they create the flow for everybody else. This is common in every almost organizational group that you put together. And the invitation is, who's gonna take the lead? And somebody raises their hand, most people are not willing to because most people want to follow a leader who's willing to lead. And once you raise your hand, all of a sudden people begin to follow. And that's exactly what we find in the storyline, that there is this participation almost of the whole city. The priests get involved, the, the men, the women, the children, the families, the educated and uneducated get involved, the skilled and unskilled laborers get involved, the country folk and the city folk get involved because of leaders who start to move in a direction. They go, yes, I want to be part of it. And they start to join into the journey. It's such a beautiful picture to see how they come together, except for one group. Almost the whole city, but one group. And wouldn't you know they're included in the scriptures? I always think, why does God include some of these little nuanced things? Well, there's a purpose behind it, but this is what we read. The next section was repaired by the men of Tekoa. But their nobles would not put their shoulders to the work under their supervisor. Tension in the city. Who are these nobles? Well, in Ancient Egypt, ancient Middle East cultures, they would have nobles. Nobles were simply those who usually had relationship with somebody of high influence and significance. So it could be a priest, a lawyer, a doctor along the way. And they provide a space for people in their friend group or network and they have these positions called the noble positions. They get a voice of authority. So what's happening here, I think, is either they're thinking the work is a little below me so I'm not gonna do it, or for certain, I'm not working for that supervisor. Any of you ever have a supervisor you did not want to work for? I've had groans all day from that one because a name popped into your head like that. We've all had supervisors that we don't want to work for. And it's a real challenge to work with people that you don't want to work for. Well, that's what we find in this given place. And yet, what do you do when you have a supervisor that you don't want to work for? And why don't you want to work for them? Maybe it's because they might have a little bit of an arrogance where they feel like you just do all the work and you feel like you're just handed down all the work to do. It could be the way that they treat you or treat other people. But what do you do when you have a supervisor that you don't want to work for? Could I give you a simple answer? You work. If you have an identity in God, through faith in Jesus Christ, you work. One, because God created us to work, and secondly, he is our supervisor. Let me just call this out with greater detail. This is from Colossians, and this has helped me. In times when I feel like I don't want to do this work or I don't want to work for this person, when I came to faith in Christ, I mean, it transformed everything in my life, including my attitude to those who are hard to work with and for. And Paul says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Jesus Christ you are serving. I don't know how you view your life or your job, 
But whether you like it or not, whether you like your supervisor or not, Jesus Christ is your supervisor. He's your number one. So if you need to cry out for help, God, help me get through this day because this, this individual is impossible to work with, but you are my supervisor. <laughs> Give me what I need because he's gonna bring the best out of you. That's his promise. He's gonna help you get through that day. So what do you do when you're working for a supervisor that you don't want to work for? You work or leave the organization and go elsewhere if you need to. That's the call, this simple invitation to work with those that want to work, and if you don't want to work, well, work anyway. Are you liking me so far, or is this really <laughs> bothering you at this point? <laughs> Stay with me, let's go to the organizational habit number three, delegation. Give authority and responsibility for tasks and decisions to others. Just quite simply, good leaders have this ability to define specific tasks and define specific people to do the tasks. Delegation becomes part of our life and our journey. And we find that the key word in the section, if I was to read the whole thing, is the word section. And it appears 13 times. So again, visualize Nehemiah making his way around the city and the walls are destroyed and he's thinking, how is this gonna come together? If he sees the hole, it's destroyed and it becomes destructive hard, which has been for 90 years. But he's trying to make it doable hard. How can we get this done? And he's riding around and he's going, well, that, that's a section, that's a section, that's a section, and he divides the project into 13 sections. So what was destructive hard becomes Doable hard, it's still hard. My daughter um, graduated from KU uh, with a degree in her, in her college pursuit um, in ancient Chinese civilization art. Yeah, I, I know, that's kinda how I responded. I was real quiet when she told me that she was shifting from psychology to ancient Chinese civilization art. Like, why? I am of no help to you, dear. I have, when you're done, I don't know what to do with you. Well, you have to figure your way out, but I'm available, I'll pray for you, I'll love you, whatever. She had a passion for this unique deal and did very, very well in it. But one thing she did consistently through college is she would call me when she had to do her big papers uh, for end of semester or whatever, and she'd be overwhelmed, usually in tears. Dad, could you help me? Because the whole project is overwhelming and I would say, well, just tell me about the project. And together, we would divide the paper into sections. And I said, just do one section at a time. You'll get through the section. What seems destructive hard becomes doable hard. And it's the way it is in life. Sometimes you have a week, and maybe it's this week that you're dealing with a week that seems impossible. You don't know how you're gonna get through the week. Just get through today. It starts with today. Maybe it's this hour. Get through this hour and then go to the next hour. Break it down into sections and that's a great way to enter into the arena. I was thinking about this power of just specific um, t task and specific people to do the task. It requires the art of delegating. You can do this, you really can. This principle of breaking down to sections, thinking it through, who can step into that? So I started to think, why are we so shy when it comes to delegating? When all of us could probably do better with delegating and have freer lives, more joyful lives, and also see people grow. So I decided to put a multiple choice question together concerning you. Why do you have such a struggle delegating? So I'm gonna give you several options. One of them will sting you. You don't have to nudge the person with you, but one of them will likely sting you. So just grow in your own delegation prowess. First of all, could it be that it will take longer to explain it than to do it? It's just too much time, just let me do it. But you know, that becomes a pattern in your life when others could step in and take care of that. But the moment is there. Or B, could it be, if it's going to be done right, you're the only one who can do it because you are better than anybody else. Now you might be nudging, I don't know. See, you like it, so you want to do it. It carries the idea that you don't want to stop doing what you love to do. But there are others who love to do it too. How could they step into the joy of it? Or could it be D, you feel guilty about adding more work? That's my sting. I'm a little too sensitive about the workload of everybody else in the team that I'm shy to want to give it to them because they're raising four kids and doing this and doing that. And then I thought, you know, I raise four kids too. I, just do it, you know, so this is my sting. And then there's E, you want to feel indispensable. That is, you want to keep your job. 
You don't want to delegate yourself out of a job in the journey. How are we doing so far? There is an F, by the way. I don't have it on here. It's all the above. And I, I don't know how to help you. You're on your own at that point. But which one of these could you just kind of elevate, def, define, and say, I'm going to do better at delegating in life and journey and see how God will use that and take it. Okay, let's keep going. You ready for the fourth habit of highly effective, organized people? Jump into it. It's connection. I love this one, but you might have to sit on it with me for a moment. That collaborative assignments connected to your shape creates excellence. At Westwood, we have this acronym we've used through the years called SHAPE. It speaks to your whole being. It's talking about your spiritual gifts, your heart and your passions, your abilities and capacities, your personality, and your experiences. If you get an assignment that comes out of your shape, I mean, it's like high octane. It's the best of the best. But if you can work out of your shape in a collaborative way with somebody else's shape, it, it creates this thing called excellence. Because we were never meant to do it alone. God intended us to work in partnership together in life and journey. And so this connection becomes an important part of our learning and collaboration together. We find in Nehemiah these words, above the horse gate, the priests made repairs, each in front of his own house. Oh, that's interesting. Next to them, Zadok made repairs opposite his house. Next to him, Shemaiah, the guard at the east gate, made repairs. He got to make the repairs on the gate where he was the guard. Do you think he's going to make a good gate? Certainly he will. You can see what's happening here, and you could elevate this little phrase as I've done, that next to them, next to him, next to them, next to him, it appears 20 times in uh, episode four of Nehemiah chapter three. <laughs> and it's carrying this idea of this collaborative sense of being together, taking the best of who I am with the best of who others are in spaces that are places that I live in and belong to and therefore I give my best. So he utilizes builders and laborers and artisans to do this amazing work that they get to work out of their sweet spot in order then morale will go up and joy will rise, things will get done, and they'll get done well. And you see this played out in simple ways, even in your, your own neighborhoods. I mean, we've lived in our same neighborhood since 1995, and when we bought into that neighborhood, there were no trees, it was, I had not one tree on our property, it was plain kind of homes that all looked alike, and so we've lived there, and some of our other neighbors have lived there through the journey. About 10 years ago, somebody put a new door in the cul-de-sac behind us, a new door on their house. Within months, Everybody had a new door. <laughs> what is that about? Within a few years, surfaces are being redone. The houses are looking different. They don't look like cookie cutter houses any longer. It's, and the trees are all grown and beautiful. It's a beautiful neighborhood, but there's a contagion when you care about the neighborhood that you're in that says, if you did that, I can do that too. And you just lift each other up in the journey of beautifying our lives and the purposes that God has for us. So collaborative assignments connected to your shape will bring about and create excellence. Habit number five is supervision. That is, inspect what you expect, oh, but with respect. It's just to say that we all have um, expectations that are placed on us. Are they reasonable and good? If they are, I think all of us want to know, what is the expectation you have for me? Be really clear about the expectation. But then complement it with inspection. Inspection is just a call for feedback. Am I doing what's expected? Can I do what's expected? Could you develop me if I can't do what's expected? That little combination is so important. I read an HBR, um, Harvard Business Review article on this given subject matter. and said the number one practice of managers in the workplace that make a difference for productivity is when the managers um, connect weekly with their team, verbally, related to expectation, how they're doing, because we want feedback, we want to grow, and it makes total sense to me that we would welcome that given feedback. And so I ask, who is the best boss that you've ever worked for? I, I already know that you've been thinking about the supervisor you didn't like, you've already thought about that. How about the best boss and supervisor that you've worked for, and what one quality stands out to you about them? I thought about that, and I've had many supervisors through the years, but the one that would really change my life would bring out the best of who I am when I didn't even know that best was even in me. Now, that's a good manager. And I was in my 20s, and he was hard. High expectations. I questioned whether I could do what he wanted me to do, and he would say, you can do it. 
And then he gave me more responsibility and more responsibility. He just stretched me in the whole journey. And he came from a different generation of management in terms of inspection and feedback related to that. He was a note writer, and he would give verbs around it on occasion, but he would write a note. If you didn't meet the expectation, this is how you first heard about it. It was written on a note in very short sentences, and the note was written with red ink. It was different than the black ink notes or the blue ink notes. When you got the red, it's early morning, and I go to my box, and I see the red, my heart's going, oh, he's about to stretch me, help me see something I didn't see, and that's how he did it, but he did it in a way with respect, and when there's respect, you'll give your all, and you'll be stretched to see all that God made you to be. I think we live under the lip of all that God intends for us, and he uses people to help move us Burst forth with the potential that he has for us in life and journey. So our call is to give our best. Nehemiah was this great leader and this great manager. That you inspect what you expect, but with great respect. And then the final one is appreciation. Simple, straightforward, recognize and reward effort. That's what Nehemiah did so beautifully. He recognized those who contributed. The fact that there are 38 names tells you, first of all, he knew the names of the people who were leading these sections, and he recognizes the good work that they do. And there's a few exceptions who did just great work. One of them was Baruch. This is what he says. Baruch, son of Zabai, zealously repaired another section. He throws a little adjective in there that he zealously, which actually in Hebrew is translated enthusiastically that he did his work enthusiastically, which means that Nehemiah noticed it, that the team noticed it, but more importantly, God noticed it. and said, I'm just gonna carve out a little space for you in the third episode of Sparking Joy with Nehemiah so people will see the enthusiasm and what difference it made in your section of the wall. I'm not gonna put the scripture up there, but in Nehemiah 3, there's also um, a shalom, a, an individual, a guy, a dad, who's working on his portion of the wall with his daughters. And it really stands out that they're noted there because women worked hard. They were appreciated for their hard work, but not always recognized for their hard work. And everybody wanted to work with shalom because they felt valued and they felt recognized. Didn't matter if you were a child or an adult, you felt the value of that given journey. So, hey, the call is appreciate and respect um, those that you're working with. Show appreciation, send a note, do something that creates that in your culture. On our team, when we do all staff meetings at Westwood, we have what we call an honor moment. So everybody gets a card and they honor somebody who's really stood out to them in the workplace uh, in between our gatherings. And then you get those in your box and it's a little lift to your spirit to know that you're being honored, recognized. And that encouragement brings us together as a team. How could you do that even this week? Okay, that's uh, episode four in one of the hardest chapters, which quite honestly, if I would have paid closer attention to outlining it, I would have delegated that chapter to somebody else. That's what I would have done. That would have been a great move for me to go like, how do I deal with that? But as I sat into it, I go, oh man, the beauty of God's word, it is alive. It speaks to us. If you're willing just to go close, pay attention, so rich and so beautiful. So can I just take a step back with you and just in this hard text, share a few observations that I have from it. Three of them specifically. First of all, I noticed in studying it that there are three kinds of workers. Those who do no work, those who work, and those who work enthusiastically. And they all get noted. And I think about those who were unwilling to work, that said no. Do you think if they would have known that God was gonna just insert them in the scripture so billions of people would see that they chose not to show up for work, that they might have rolled up their sleeves and showed up for work, I think they would have in the journey. And we're called to work. Celebrate the beauty of what it means to contribute to the work of God in the world in which we live. It's part of our growth in confidence this year. Secondly, I'm taken back after these things started to populate in heart and head when I'm studying this, the simplicity and power of habits that are forged by character strength to say, by these disciplines, great and mighty things happen. Six simple habits of highly organized people. Simplification, the ability to explain simply 
um, those that are involved with you so that greater results could happen, participation. That when I can work in that beautiful realm of, um, of working with people who are lead, count me in, I wanna participate and be part of it. Delegation, who else can share in the workload so I just don't keep doing it myself or connection, this ability related to our, our, our shape, not just our individual shape, but how it intersects with the shape of others. The supervision, just to be mindful of how hard it is to supervise, but to be clear on expectation, and then to expect to give feedback, and then that appreciation, the simple act of just saying, thanks, well done, way to go, and that, that just stands out to me. Of these six, what stands out to you? What could use a little bit more lift? What can you celebrate and nurture even more deeply? Leave that to you. My final thought, and then we'll wrap it up, is the reality of where we are as the church, and that is there's work to be done. Yes, at your home, and yes, in your marketplace, but even the church of Jesus Christ. We are called to work collaboratively together. And I wanna say, first of all, thank you to all of you who've just been in the game. And you serve with enthusiasm. I think of these parking lot attendants and 20 below windshield, I just say, say thank you when you leave to them. I just, what an amazing, they just, they work with joy. If you wouldn't know these leaders, you're just impressed. Never complain, they just go out and do it to keep us safe. I love this about them. Um, we have needs for teachers and leaders and administrators, support capacities from finance to ministry fronts to the far end of the world as we got the invitation earlier to participate in. But you may think that everything's covered, it's not that there are some of you that we really need in the game. So if you would fill out an engagement card and say, I would like to learn more, we will call you this week. Just fill it out, leave it at the info spot, we'll follow up. And, and then the, the third piece is just this, this joy of knowing that we get to be the church in this time and place. And we wanna be on the front line, and I wanna be on the front line together with you. So I pray that we could collaboratively join together to that end. One final thought, and then we're gonna go. Mother Teresa said this, not all of us can do great things, but we can do Small things with great love. And I sat on that and I thought, the cumulative effect of doing dozens and hundreds and thousands of small things with great love has massive impact on a world that's hungry for love. So the invitation is, let us organize well so that we will love well and love all to the glory of Jesus Christ, who has loved us. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for the reminder of habits, so simple and yet, Father, put together, just create a synergy movement forward that get things done for your name, for your glory, for the benefit of all humanity. So might we be quickened to things that would sharpen our own habits, our own character, those disciplines that would put us in a place to be all you want us to be, to do all that you want us to do, to go where you want us to go. Bring us together as your church, that we would be an aroma in this community, here, near, and far, all to your glory, we pray in Jesus' name, amen.